to open up with this, I guess uh, we got emails from most of you all and phone numbers and so forth, addresses. So uh, if you want to get some more information on the Western Kansas Beekeeping, the very bottom item, Western Kansas Beekeepers, uh, they're meeting next Sunday afternoon at Dodge City at the Western States Bank Arena building and fairground. Really nice building out there. And, uh, you know, we set that meeting day, we didn't realize that that's also Super Bowl and had no idea the Chiefs were going to do so well. But we should be done well in time for that. So I don't know if we'll make it back home in time to watch the commercials. I'm, I'm not a big football fan. But anyway, I, I do enjoy the Chiefs once in a while. But uh, I really like the commercials for the Super Bowl. But uh, anyway, that's next Sunday afternoon. But what I want to ask a couple questions here. How many of y'all are uh, just kind of curious about honeybee? Just, you know, just here maybe learn a few things. Or are you more like you're already a beekeeper? Is anybody in that category right now has a box of bugs in their backyard? Getting closer? If across would let you, you would, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, my brother had 14 hives in North Carolina that I helped him handle okay. some. So, so you've been involved, you've had a little bit, a little bit. you've been stung. Yeah, I've been yeah. stung. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, we did that last week, so someone asked if it ever been, how many times have been bit or never been bit? So, never once, no, so bees never bite you. They'll sting the crap out of you sometimes. Usually not though, always suit up or at least a bail. And uh, we'll get a little bit of a repeat of that. So uh, any plan to start the hobby maybe this coming year where it's impending, where you're gonna do it, take your high water, you're gonna get some bees and so forth. Did I think I, did you, were you able to get a hold of uh, mm -hmm. Carl up in Norton? I, I was, Okay. but uh, that ad, the guy called me that knows you here in Hayes, uh -huh. that's wanting to get out of it. And he's got two established hives. Oh. Okay. Gonna, I'm gonna meet him after this class. To well, talk good. Stuff. Good. Okay. Rand, Randall, Rand, Braden? Rand, huh? Braden. His his wife just recently passed. Yeah, out, Randy right? Braden. Randall Braden. Randall. Oh, I didn't know he was gonna leave the hobby. That's too bad. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I said he said he went to get out. I didn't know if him and his wife had done it together a little bit. Talked and he's kind of. I helped her capture a swarm in a neighbor's tree one day. And uh, yeah, she he was out of town, and uh, that was yeah. a lot of fun. The neighbor didn't think it was too fun because she had daycare. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in a swarm, the bees are pretty calm. They're they're not interested in attacking anybody. Nobody got stung. I still put a bail on to just in case you never know. But uh, yeah, swarm. We'll talk a little bit about swarming later on. But swarms are usually pretty calm. You know, they're hey, they're homeless. They're hanging out on a tree or a mailbox or whatever for a few hours, maybe a few days. They probably already know where they're going, but they're, they're not out to attack anybody. And you can play with them a little bit if you want without any fear. Um, again, with the emails, if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna forward them on to the state because I believe the state association is uh, gonna grant a free one-year membership to anybody who takes a, a class this year. And they'll, the big thing about it, you get the newsletter by email. So they gotta have your email. They're not gonna, we did that to save postage when I was president a few years back. Um, I printed off a couple copies. I have one extra copy left in the capping newsletter, and I, I don't mean to speak ill whatsoever. Stephanie, she's a nice lady. She's a current editor, and I can get you all more copies by, by email. See, I'm going to give you all. Thank you. I can send you guys some copies out. There's just not much in this one. Uh, there's a little bit of talk about the uh, the national associations always meet in January, and the American Honey Producers. Association met in Chicago. Who would set up a meeting in Chicago in January? But it's still a good turnout. I guess there's probably a thousand people or so there uh, from around the uh, around the country. But uh, there's a lot of, uh, like I said, the Western Kansas group. Uh, we just meet every other month. So we're going to be in Dodge City next Sunday. We'll be in Hayes in April, and we kind of bounce it around uh, east and west. So last week, any, did I say anything to anybody that maybe your research says you're full of beans or maybe you want to discuss a little bit farther? Anybody want to have anything that's interesting? Yeah, go ahead. Could you explain again, like, what do bees eat during the winter and how can they survive in their little box? Okay. Well, they eat honey. That's what they make it for. So that was an easy one to answer. They don't make it just for us to steal. But... Uh, that's, that's their primary food would be honey. They also will blend that with pollen to make a bee bread to feed their young, the, the larvae as they're developing. And we just call that bee bread. They, uh, as far as surviving in the box, I wish it was that easy, but you know, when we started in 1978, my brother and I, if we lost a beehive, it was probably our own stupidity. Ah, oh, man, I forgot to put the mouse guard in and the mouse 
tore things up. It, or maybe they got sprayed, you know, ag chemicals. They were an issue then, they're an issue today, but it was, you know, five, 10 percent colony loss was it. Today, I don't care how good or how bad a beekeeper you are, 40 percent is about the nationwide average of, uh, of survival, of losses, I should say. Uh, hopefully you'll be, you'll do better than that. Last winter, I think we lost, I'd have to say about 10 percent. I always keep around three dozen hives and that, uh, there we go. So that means I lost 3.6 highs. But actually, I lost three highs last winter. But when I lose mine, it's usually going into winter, around October. That's when I make a decision. A really weak hive is just a death sentence. They're just not going to make it. If they don't have anything stored up by then, it's not my fault because I'm not going to har uh, harvest anything that they don't need. I'm going to leave them. I'd rather get nothing from a hive than take too much. So, uh, uh, or maybe it was something I may have done wrong. I had them in the wrong location. Maybe there just wasn't enough stuff blooming there. Or like this summer, clover in some places was taller than I am. And normally it's only about chin high or, or uh, hip high, I mean. But last summer there were some with four, five, six, and even seven foot tall. And then when the clover was done blooming, nothing else bloomed. So yeah, I definitely had some in the wrong location. We got a heck of a, of a light honey crop, like that really light jug over there, that little bear. Uh, that's your clovers and your early spring honey, but uh, boy, that was tough for them to find something later on in the season. And some of that, I think we have rains at the wrong time, and then finally things did bloom again. The wild sunflowers are always good for, for some nectar and so forth, a good pollen source. Ooh, excuse me, but you don't see weeds like we used to anymore. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of control being done by the counties. Yeah? How long do e does each individual bee live? That's a really good question now. Right now, they're going to probably survive most all the winter. The, the queen is not laying any eggs right now, but she's going to start pretty darn soon. Once the days start getting a little longer, she'll realize that spring is just around the corner. So she's going to start laying some eggs to replace population. But from, say, April through October, November, when they're working really hard, about five weeks, they just plain work themselves to death. They, uh, they, they don't really sleep. They may rest for a few minutes here and there. We need some more chairs, and the doors are locked. <laughs> um, there's one here, oh, one there. there. Yeah, here we go. Thank you very much. You bet. All right. I'm actually still. <coughs> so anyway, summertime, spring, summer, fall, about five, six weeks. That's all the long it is. So they just plain wear out. Queen bee, I think the record is five years. But uh, we hope to get them at least through the year, especially the second year, because the second year. It seems like the queens really shine. That's when they're really doing a great job of laying eggs, and after that they start to decline. But uh, so I, I always try to remember or mark the highs. On a, I keep a notebook of what's going on with this hive and that hive, with some details anyway. I should have brought one of those sheets, I guess, uh, what I inspect for. But it's basically the record starts. Okay, this hive will have the location: wolf farm, wolf pasture. Uh, got any red wolf? Has a, lets me put some bees in there. And, and I always go like left to right. So the west hive, the left one, that's number one and so forth. And I know the queen in there was an Italian and or whatever, maybe uh, it could have been Carniola or some other variety, but, or mutt. Who knows what, uh, what we really put in there. We call them mutts because chances are 99% of the queens around the country are some kind of an Italian mixed in with some other DNA to make a hybrid Russian or what have you. The, uh, the Buckfast, you're going to guess, started out as an Italian bee many years ago and was developed into, a, into their own variety now, so true genetics. With the Russians are a hybrid. Uh, I've got yeah. a couple, maybe you're going to cover this, but yeah. uh, speaking of that, uh, as I understand, the queens will go out on a flight and that's when they get impregnated, correct? Mm -hmm. It seems like if you're in an area where there's, unless everybody's got the same kind of bees, it seems like the odds are fairly good that on that flight it may not be. It'll be a mutts. Yeah. You're going to be raising. Now, yours is going to be mated when you receive her. Yeah, so she, yeah. they've already either tried to control what's there. I'm pretty sure she's not artificially inseminated because that would have been hundreds of dollars, if not thousands, for that queen. But uh, she'll be openly inseminated with who knows what. But they, well, then when they clip their wings, uh -huh. Subsequently, how do, how do they, if they don't take that flight again? That's how they, they mate the one time. They'll, they'll maybe mate over three or four or five days. 
It's when they're very young. So they, ne they never take But them. once they once they mate it and then they're back in their hive and mm -hmm. they start laying eggs, they'll never mate again. Another question. Really? Um, I keep reading about nectar flow. Mm -hmm. For this area, when is when is that time period or time period? We might be. Uh, no, I think that was last week. It, it kind of depends. Uh, it's going to really hit about May. Our big nectar flow here is May because around Memorial Day is when the clover comes out. The wild, sweet yellow clover starts blooming like crazy. Um, gay, Kansas gay feather and I'm trying to think of some of the other weeds. Uh, milkweed comes up in maybe June, but our biggest flow is going to be starting in May and ending about wheat harvest time. And then there's sometimes there's a wall, we call it a dearth, where there's just not much out there. And then things kind of pick up in August, September. Hopefully we've had some rains and then the fall blooming things will come along. And, and so out, out of the nectar, crop. when it's not during the nectar flow, is it basically pollen then that they're... They're going to find something. They may need water. They may need. They might find some nectar. There just may not be a whole lot out there, but they'll be bringing in a lot of pollen too. Yeah. Very good question. <coughs> uh, you don't feed yours through the winter, right? So how much? We may have to. <laughs> how much honey do you usually leave? We leave the bottom two boxes. Uh, the like those two. The, the deep brood. Those two deeps, and I always leave a third something. Now maybe when I'm harvesting in uh, in August through early October, I pull out a frame and it's not cap whatsoever. It's just still a, a liquid nectar. I'm no way can I right. mix that in. It's going to go. Uh, it will sour uh, your honey. It'll sour things exactly. Yeah, kind of a fermentation, but not a fun fermentation. So I always leave a third box with something, and there may be only two or three or four frames of nectar in there, or it's basically it's just not ripe honey. I leave that behind. My big thing in twenty. 13, I lost no hives that, that winter. My big thing was that third box. I, I got it. I solved the mystery. 2014, I lost about 50% of them. So, <laughs> well, so much for that. <laughs> that was not, and they can starve in a hive full of honey. Yeah. This is a hard thing to do. You'll go out there and maybe a nice warm February day is 50 degrees and they're buzzing all over. And a couple weeks later, we get a nice warm day and nothing. And you open it up. It got cold in between those two days and nice weather and they clustered up but they didn't move over to the next frame that had all kinds of honey or move up just a couple of inches. If it gets too cold, too long, they're going to ball up and just not move at all. So these, this wishy-washy weather we have in Kansas is really pretty good. It breaks them up, moves them around and they can relocate within a hive. But if we get a sudden really severe cold snap, they may not cluster up tight enough and they could perish also because they're scattered throughout the hive and uh, they're not in a nice tight ball keeping each other warm. Because if this is a beehive there, they don't have a furnace to heat the whole thing. They just cluster up tightly to one another and kind of wiggle their, their wings are disconnected. The muscles, they disconnect from their wings and they kind of vibrate. Just kind of shimmy their shoulders, so to speak. And then that's how they keep one another warm. So the warmer, uh, the bees on the outside are kind of cold. They're gonna wiggle their way into the middle of that ball of, of bees and those bees inside are maybe a little warmer than they want to be, they're going to climb through that. So that cluster is always in motion. But what they're doing is just kind of vibrating to keep one another warm. The actual hive itself... Do you maybe, insulate your hives? Won't be any... What's that? Do you insulate your hives? Already? I don't. Uh, there are a few folks that do, and I think the survival is just not really proven that. Now, once you get to Nebraska North, they usually do insulate them. And there's also a company, B-Max. They make a a styrofoam uh, beehive and they're like two and a half inches thick of foam and uh, the only thing I have with that my brother has one is they need to reinforce it in places because bees blew everything down when you're prying things up it's going to bend up and break up that foam so we need to, is that need a cover to add, some, or add some features to that hive to make is it that a cover or a, a literally made out of yeah the cover is literally made out of styrofoam you have to paint it so the sunlight doesn't tear them up of course but uh, those are used a lot like in Norway and Canada and Alaska. I mean, they keep bees in all 50 states. I mean, imagine, Ala I used to think Alaska really, the, well, yeah, 24 hour sunshine in the summertime. They're out there working, working, working. They're, I mean, they may only have a short couple of months that they can really bring in some nectar and pollen and stuff, but man, they got it 24 hours a day. So, well, that makes perfect sense. So, what are the questions? She's homeschooled and she's actually then doing beekeeping right now. Okay. Right about these, she wants to tell you to tell her about uh, royal jelly. Royal jelly? You know, I don't know really a whole lot about royal jelly. It's a very, very high protein substance that the younger bees produce with some kind of glands within their 
their gut. It's a milky looking substance. And all young bees, as soon as they hatch, they're fed royal jelly for two to three days. And the queen bee, if they're making a queen bee, she's fed royal jelly all the way through. That's why they, they name it royal jelly, because that's the only thing she is fed during her development. Um, you can buy royal jelly. I would be careful because some of it may be some kind of a blend of royal jelly and, and uh, oh God, I'm trying to think of uh, yogurt. I mean, there's all kinds of people blend things together they shouldn't anyway. And a lot of royal jelly may come from uh, China also, and I would be cautious because I want to, if you're buying it for a food supplement, I want to know where the source is. Make sure it's not coming from China because they use some pretty nasty antibiotics over there and their beekeeping practices that are possibly cancer causing and so forth. Where do the bees keep it? They keep it in a cone too? They just produce they it as they produce need it. As they, yeah. as they so need then it. how do they get it if they're just producing it as a... That's a good question. Yeah, it's blended from uh, nectar and pollen and, and some other sources. I don't know what's all in Royal Jelly. To tell you the truth. <coughs> how are they selling it if the bees aren't the best? They, uh, they take a pipette and draw it out of the, the honeycomb cells and and I would think it's probably a pretty tedious process. Probably oh, wow. they're doing a queen cell production and, and the queen cell's gonna have a lot of royal jelly in there so when they take the pipette to, to draw it out of there or a syringe, they're getting quite a bit more than they would a, a worker cell. So I don't really know that part of that industry so that's, uh, uh, you can also sell propolis. We mentioned it's a glue caulking, it's a medication if you will and they make a special trap that looks like a queen excluder and uh, it goes into cosmetics and some medication. I don't know much about uh, that part of the, the industry at all. We, we don't dabble in that. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned Carl from Norton earlier. Is he still in the hobby or is he? Yeah, he's just downsizing. Okay, I was wondering yeah. if I saw some stuff he was selling. Because he's selling beehive bodies and yeah, they're in good I shape. Seeing him around to buy honey, so I was curious. I think he's in Florida or heading to Florida. Oh, really? Yeah, someone says he's going to be there for about a month or so. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah. Now he didn't get that money from keeping bees. He's a banker. Oh, I know. <laughs> Retired. <laughs> so those who say, "Can you make money at this hobby?" And that was you, I believe. What? Yeah, a, yeah, Carl made his money as a working man in the bank and uh, and spent it all keeping bees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about some of the tools and equipment you need. You're gonna absolutely have to have at least a veil or something like that to protect you from stings. I want to pass around our uh, label. because it's got a picture of my brother from years ago wearing his bee suit, which is a helmet and a veil, a pair of working gloves, regular hardware store gloves, uh, a sleeve that's got elastic at each end, and a flannel shirt. So, I mean, you could do it on a shoestring. You don't have to start off with a $150 ventilated bee suit, what have you. You could do it on a shoestring. you got to have a veil. And I'm not going to show the tools again, but some kind of a high tool, a screwdriver will work in a pinch. Machete doesn't work very well, although that's all I had one time. I don't know what I did. I left my high tool at the house or something anyway. It, it, it helped break things loose, but it was pretty... I always keep a machete because my theory is one day I'm going to walk up to a hive on pallet. There's going to be a dang rattlesnake there. Now, I'm not going to get close enough with a machete, but it'll make me feel like a man. I got one in my hand and chase them off. But uh, so far, I've never, I have around a bull, across a bull snake, but no, uh, no rattlesnake. High placements, again, if you're in town, you want to have a fence or a structure or something, they fly up and over so pedestrians don't even know they're there. They're flying over their head, and they don't even see them. Keeps them out of traffic and things like that. Uh, flowers, you've got to have hundreds of millions of flowers. So in town, hives should do okay. Um, a big field of sweet clover is even better yet. Take them out to beekeeping. Basically, be uh, be aware of your non-beekeeping neighbors and, and uh, make sure you have good, healthy queens and take good care of your hives. Keep them painted and keep your equipment clean. Process your honey you're giving away or selling in a clean environment. Um, think about if somebody's making a candy bar in a chicken house, so would you want to eat it? So why would they want to eat your honey? You know, you can do it in a garage, I guess, but uh, I always figure if step one of harvesting honey is to move the Harley out of the way, then maybe that's not where I should be processing my honey. I, mean, no, I wish I had a Harley. Uh, how to get your bees, where to get them, and so forth. <coughs> so we're kind of starting now. We've released the package. We've installed her in our, in our hive. We're coming back a couple days later because we want to make sure that that queen in that little cage here, that either they've eaten through the candy that we gave them or 
If you do what I was taught was pop a cork out and put a marshmallow in there or a gummy bear, you'll chew through that in a couple of days. If you're introducing a queen uh, to maybe a split, we'll talk about splits here in a little bit, that's where you take a heavily populated hive and make two or three smaller hives out of them. You might want that queen to stay in that cage for several more days and just don't let them chew their way through. Release her on your own terms. And sometimes it's funny that they won't chew through the gummy bear or the, uh, I don't use gummy bears, I use marshmallows. They won't chew through that, they won't chew through the candy on the other end. And you think this queen wants out of here. You pop the screen off and she's just running around in the cage. And sometimes you have to tap her to get her out of there, but usually she's out like a bullet. She does want out. But in that time, if we have brand new uh, foundation in our, in our frames, they should be uh, starting to draw them out. Uh, we'll have some undrawn areas, and there's going to be kind of in the middle. We put the bees in the middle of our hive, and, uh, and the biggest work, of course, is going to be there. This is just a few days after the uh, package was installed, because now we're, we're releasing the queen. So uh, hopefully she's still in good, healthy condition. A trick that I was taught many years ago, and I've got my own honey, but I take that little queen cage, which I've got installed over there, and I'll just smear a little bit of honey on the screen. So as the bees are crawling around her and they're picking up this honey, they're also picking up her pheromone, her scent, and that helps them distribute it throughout the, the hive. So if it's a, uh, again, if it's a split and they're used to another queen that smelled completely differently, they'll pick up her pheromone, her perfumes, if you will, and, and get to uh, liking her better. Don't use grocery store honey because who knows what diseases may be in that honey. It, you don't want to introduce something to your hive. Yeah, right, uh, to that point, uh, you know, I've been watching a lot of these videos and stuff, uh -huh. and some people do the shake method and some lay it on its side and all this. What I'd like to do is when I empty that package out, is there some way I can strain that? So rather than dumping any beetles or dead bees into my hive and then trying to get them out or have, watch them scurry off, is there yep, some way don't I can kick out any dead bees. Yeah, it's just. Well, yeah, but I mean, when, you, when I'm emptying the package into the hive. Uh huh. I'd like to strain that. Is there? Is, I got you. Is there some, You know what I mean? Well, to keep the whatever debris in there from going yeah, in. If there. we're in our hive here, two, two or three, four days after we install the package, and my method, this is just kind of what it's going to look like. Your hive will not hinge. This is my teacher. Uh, the cage. When we installed her, we put the queen right here in the middle. Mm -hmm. Screen out, or at least so it's not facing the uh, the frames. Might dump some bees right on top of her and put the feeder nearby so that they don't have to go very far to get to the, uh, the feed anyway. But this cage here, after a few days, most of the bees are going to be out of it. There may no. be a few yeah, other ones. What I'm saying is when I do that dump, uh -huh. if there's any small hive beetles or, or anything that I don't want inside my hive, is there some way I can screen that, get the bees in my box? And the problem is a small hive beetle, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the right. small hive beetle is so much smaller than a, uh, than a bee, and we're right. going to be looking at them here a little bit. They're a tail of size, so I don't know how you can strain them. Yeah, I was trying to figure out a way I could somehow not dump all the debris that's in the box right. in my hive. And there, there could be, I mean, that's how diseases and pests get transmitted. It's unfortunately in packages or nucleus or used hives and so forth. There, there could be some problem in there. I don't how to do it. If I dumped them in a bucket and then dumped them, I mean, it seems like I'd be yeah. kind of in the same boat. I was just trying to... I don't think you'd be able to separate them because when they cluster up again, that little small hive beetles are going to crawl around with the bees. Right. And they're going to stay warm with the bees. They're yeah. going to feed with the bees. They, in the wintertime, they'll live right there with them, but uh, on, your, on your new package, I don't think there's any way to... But, I always install a little beetle trap. Mm -hmm. I used to use uh, mineral oil in there, but it would get kind of rancid after a while, so now you die to maceous herbs. And these little grooves in there, we can pass that around. The bees are gonna, they don't like those small hive beetles any more than we do. And we'll see them here a little bit. They're gonna kind of hurry around the hive, and the beetles will dive down in those little holes that bees can't get in there and they get into your mineral oil or, or your uh, diatomaceous earth and that'll perish them. So early seen, on, early on do something like that to help control that population. Have you seen guys using those Swifter pads? Mm -hmm. I guess you have. Yeah, <laughs> we use this a lot too. Does that work? It, it really does. That's a uh, shop rag, uh, brawny. And uh, the small hive beetles got like a little spur on their legs and they get caught in there. Oh man, I meant to bring some. I've got some 
of those with, that look like you just peppered them with uh, small high beetles. They're in the freezer. Oh, shoot. Oh, I've got to start writing notes down before I do these. Uh, I meant to bring that, but I've got some that are just peppered with, with small high beetles. Those are really capturing. I don't like chemicals. I just don't like using chemicals. So the trap, mineral oil or diatomaceous earth isn't going to hurt my bees because they can't get to it. They're not going to be able to fit in those little holes. And that brawny cloth, the bees can walk all over it. And they'll chew it up eventually anyway. They'll shred it in a couple of weeks, but um, the bees or the beetles get stuck on it. So it works. Where do you put it in, in the hive? Right on top. Right on top of your hive. Oh, you yeah. Maybe cut them in little strips about, uh, because the sheets are you know, about 11 inches square. Cut them in strips, put a half here and a half over here. So yeah, that'll capture that'll capture some of your pests right away. That's probably again, it's about the best thing you can do to for the beetles anyway. Because you're gonna do the oxalic acid treatment on the uh, package, so that should hopefully knock out every single mite that comes in there, if any come with them. Uh, that's really wordy, but inspecting your hive, if it's really cold, let's not do that. So 50 degrees or better, maybe a sunny day is best. <clears throat> if it's that cool, it's okay to do it, but make it quick. Don't be looking at that frame forever trying to find the queen when there's brood in there that are chilling and, and they're gonna die when you put them back in the uh, hive because they got too chill. So make your inspections in cooler weather as quickly as possible. What I do on, on uh, any time I'm inspecting the hive is Approach it from the side or the rear. You don't want to get in the front door, especially in summer when there's 60,000 of them in there. Pop off the lid, put it upside down, and I'll remove the top box and set it on there and then start doing my inspection. A uh, cool tool that I got a couple years ago. Oops. This frame holder, I think that is great because you can, you can pull out a frame and oh, there's nothing going on here. Hang it there and look at some more frames and oh, there's my queen. I want to protect her. Maybe I'm going to put her over here. The worst thing I've done is after I put all my frames back in is I get the hive built back together and sometimes I forget. I only own one of them and then I forget to leave it on. And I walk away and there's these little rods staying on the <laughs> Great. I'm going to tear the hive apart again to get my tool back. So yeah, I don't uh, I don't outfit every hive with one. But this is this is a nice. This is one of those. Yeah, a couple of years from now, I need to get me a couple of these or one of these. They're around $20, I suppose, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, yeah, use your high tool, pry loose the outermost uh, frame because they probably haven't glued them down. You know, this is early on. This is only a few days after that package is in there. So we're going to remove the outer couple of frames and start getting into the core of the population. Um, we should notice in there some whitish comb uh, being built on our, on our new foundation. Or if you were blessed with some used foundation, there might be some nice, shiny, clean uh, comb being built on, on them. Maybe some spots were damaged that they're repairing, getting ready for the queen to lay eggs in there. I do recommend, if at all possible, you're probably going to get the plastic foundation with your highs these days, the black plastic for your bottom couple of boxes, for your jeeps, for your brood. It's so easy to see that little white egg on a black background than it is that white egg on an off-white background with an off-white comb around it. It's, uh, it's just so much easier to see them on a, on a black background. Uh, the center of those front combs, of course, they're gonna have your eggs and larvae because that's where the queen was placed. Um, finding the queen early on, it shouldn't be a problem. She's gonna be pretty large. She'll be about the size of a wasp, She'll an inch plus long. Uh, and the bees are a little bit shorter than that, of course. There uh, should be some drones in there, possibly. Uh, depending on where the packages come from, they may have drones in them, but usually in March and, and April, there aren't very many drones around just yet. Uh, but if you, if you can't find your queen, but you see eggs, you see signs of larvae developing different stages, she's in there. You just, maybe it's cold, you better put things back together and not, not chill things. <clears throat> I think we might have looked at this one. One egg, yeah, see this is your, your uh, natural cover foundation, I guess it would be the term they call it, one egg in the middle, and shrink that down to the size of a 22 bullet. That could be kind of hard to see, depending on your, how, uh, how good your vision is. There's the queen on the left depositing a, an egg in the, in the center. And the larvae is there developing. Again, here we've got a bunch of eggs. We've got some, I don't know if you can see very well, there's some newly hatched larvae in there. There's some larvae that are just about ready to turn into a pupa. And these over here have been capped over so 
their final stage of metamorphosis is happening right here. So at 10 days after that egg is laid, whether it's a queen or a worker or a groom, they're capping over that, uh, that larvae so they can transform into their, their metamorphosis to become the uh, actual pupa and then turn into an adult worker bee or a drone bee or whatever that may be. There's different pollens and nectars. Uh, shiny stuff is gonna be some pollen and some of this is probably blended. Uh, there's pollen, this is some nectar here. Some of these may be a color where they blended the pollen and the nectar together and they're gonna be feeding that bee bread to their, uh, their developing young. But you may notice a variety of colors. I don't have any good clean frames of uh, pollen to share, but man, they'll be not really pink, but maybe a red, orangish, greens, all kinds of colors, yellows. So when they first hatch out, there's an egg. Yeah, let's find the smallest. That's about the smallest larvae, about the uh, newspaper print C in a curl. That's about all the larger that, that larva is. I'm hoping we can put together a queen rearing class this summer with the uh, Western Kansas group. And we'll actually be pulling some of those tiny larvae out and grafting them into some queen cell cups to, uh, to make some queens. Uh, that's going to be quite involved to get that set up, so I'm hoping we can swing that. But, but there's a variety of age of developing young from the age, eggs to recently hatched to several days along the way. And <clears throat> three weeks, we should start seeing all kinds of stuff. We should start seeing what we see in the upper and, the, and on the left, hopefully. This is kind of what we call a spotty brood pattern, where we may have, a, oh, maybe they got into some kind of diseased pollen when they were out collecting, or, or not necessarily disease, but uh, chemical. Could have been some ag chemical spraying, and they got into that. Oh, excuse me, and the uh, larvae weren't viable or they weren't able to uh, withstand the uh, being fed that pollen and, and maybe they're dying or maybe the queen is going bad. She, maybe she wasn't very well mated and that's what we're seeing instead. That would be, could be a sign of a number of things. That's when you want to get your mentor in there and say, man, what have I got going in here? Bill, please tell me what, uh, and, uh, or maybe on really close examination, there's all kinds of eggs in there and or perhaps some of these have just hatched out recently. So you want to really examine carefully to see what, uh, what's going on in there. Again, three to four weeks, look at your traffic on your front porch, there'll be a lot of bee activity coming and going. If they don't have a queen on board, they're not very motivated to bring in food and, and pollen because they're, hopefully if any eggs related at all, they're busy producing a new queen on their own. Uh, you'll find out as you pull the frames out, maybe you'll see some, uh, some queen cells. We'll look at some here in a moment. But uh, three weeks of the brood nest should really start just increasing in size. Several frames should be being drawn out very well. Even if you like, if you get your bees through us at the end of March, you know, they think, oh, it's still cold in winter. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff blooming then. So on those warm days, they can get out there. But if they can't get out, they're still working in the hives. So you make sure they're fed, well fed. Uh, maybe a pollen patty might be necessary. Uh, I always do that on my new packages and, and swarms and such. So they've got the protein to make synthetic uh, nectar, sugar syrup, but we should have a lot of frames of drawn comb and you can't stop feeding yet uh, unless they stop taking it for some reason. Maybe they found a heck of a, a pollen source, but that's unlikely this early into the, uh, you, you'll probably be feeding your brand new package for maybe five, six weeks or better. But sometimes they'll just keep on taking them, just packing it away in the cells and you'll, you'll look up the comb and you look, oh, that's, that's sugar in there, that's not nectar. So then if, if they just plain keep taking it because you're giving it to them, then you can stop, but uh, you should have a lot of capped brood and, and uh, brood in all stages of development. So now we're getting in there. Now we got 10 frames in that hive. Now seven to eight of them are just loaded with bees. It's time for box number two. That's kind of the rule I would say, 70, 80%. If that comb is drawn out that well, then we can expand. We don't want to crowd them too much. But uh, and here's how I'm going to break the rules. I run nine frames in all my boxes, whether it's a brood chamber or the honey chambers. We've almost always done nine frame in the, in the honey supers because they'll draw that comb past the wood. It just stores, nine frames will store more honey than 10 tightly packed frames will. But I do mine at nine and I got that when I went to the uh, University of Nebraska for the queen rearing school back about nine years ago, I think it was. They ran nine frames everything because it's easier to get in that hive and not damage bees. Because when you start pulling out a frame in a heavily populated hive, you're gonna be rolling some bees and injuring them. And that one, you sure don't want to hurt your queen. 
If you lose a few drones, eh, they're just spend, they're expendable. Uh, we got to have them for DNA, but other than that, there's plenty of them in the hive. So, but uh, if you don't see a good solid brood pattern, or if you see multiple eggs, and we'll see a photo of that here in a moment, it's probably time to put a new queen in there. So when again, you, when, you your your, when, when you go to your second box, do you leave your queen scooter on top of the brood queen? No, you want her to. Those are your brood boxes. So those bottom two boxes. That's all for rearing brood. So you want to go ahead and move that, or not even have a queen excluder yet, not until you start adding your honey supers on. So your first two boxes, that's just for, for the queen and her, uh, her workers to lay eggs and store, uh, not store, store a little bit of honey, but to raise the young. The brood chambers is what we're going to call them. Nice strong colony here. Uh, it's got good population. This is probably, well, this is two boxes, so it's obviously probably in the middle of the summer. Here's an example of a ventilated bee suit. Santa Claus didn't bring me one this year, but uh, everybody I know who owns one loves them. Boy, they, they say, yeah, you can, you can wear shorts and bikini or whatever you want in your regular bee suit, you're still gonna sweat. But in these things, uh, the air passes right through. It's like multiple layers of mesh with a thin layer of foam in there, so they cannot sting through it. Although, I had an opportunity, it fell through, but uh, opportunity to go to Kenya this last summer and work with some beekeepers over there. And, and I asked somebody, I said, so as hot as it is there, do I want to bring a ventilator suit? They don't know. No, you know, because <laughs> they've got African bees there. So you want some good, good, sturdy uh, bee suit. This is what I hope you get to see by the end of the year, but with a brand new package, a brand new frame, a brand new foundation, your bees are gonna spend a lot of energy just building comb, making honeycomb, and, and uh, you, you may not be able to get a hive stack like this unless you're blessed to start off with some pre-drawn out comb. Last year's comb from maybe a, a hive that passed on or if you get used hive bodies from somebody that, like Carl, you know, he'll have some, some fully drawn comb that's ready to go. Uh, this may be what you look like here in, in say August or so. This is a colony that's obviously too strong. They're gonna swarm or they're in the process of swarming actually. We'll talk about swarming here in a little bit. This is a photo that I got from a couple from Syracuse last summer. They went to Iowa to buy a nucleus, a little miniature high from a uh, reputable company up there. And they went up there in June. They drove all the way from Syracuse to Iowa to get this. And that's what they got. Man, that, uh, that nucleus hive should have been bursting with population. And, and in June, uh, that hive should have been ready for a second box. And it was, it was a sad thing. I, I hate to say it, but that, I can't believe that company with a good reputation to them. I'm not going to say who it is because that had to be an isolated incident. Um, if you're buying a, a used hive, a live hive from somebody, or a nucleus hive, make sure you get to pop the top. See what's going on in there and see how well populated they are. And I'm thinking that uh, they probably drove all that way and it was all strapped up, duct taped up, took it home in the trunk of the car or whatever. And the next day they opened up and sent me this, these kind of photos. Uh, that photo, I should say. This is what a working, a worker who is laying because you don't have a queen will do. She'll put four or five, three, four or five eggs in a, uh, in a cell. None of them are gonna survive, but if one egg is in there and it comes out of a worker, they're not fertilized, they're gonna be drones. So your, your hive, what this means here is your hive is doomed. You need a new queen ASAP. Oh, there's just some wild comb. I mean, it's important when you're, uh, when you're putting your hive together, that you put all the frames in there, because if not, they'll fill the space. They, they do bird comb, they'll do all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, that's a, I think that's a feeder that, for some reason, the bees built comb in it. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they're independent contractors. They do not read the Beekeeping for Dummies books. They're gonna do whatever the heck they want in your box. And that's in somebody's uh, attic. It's a wild comb, just all kinds. Usually in a stud cavity, they're at an angle and they're perfectly spaced with something we call bee space. Reverend Langstroth discovered out about 150 years ago that bees like somewhere between a quarter of an inch and three-eighths of an inch of space. And when you're spacing your frames, that's what they, they are apart. Anything larger than that, they're gonna bridge it with comb. They're gonna build some stuff in there and do all kinds of crazy things like this. Uh, growing your bee colony, this is several weeks in after the uh, package or maybe the nucleus has been installed. And, come along. I think we looked at this uh, frame a little bit last week. 
This peanut looking device here is a, a queen cell. They're, oh, maybe about an inch or so long, uh, inch and a quarter perhaps, a little bit bigger than that. These bullet looking uh, capped off uh, brood down there, those are gonna be drones because they're so much larger. They're, their cells are slightly larger. I think it's like 5.4 millimeters versus uh, 5.1 for a standard <coughs> bee. So the, the drone cell is much larger and they're such a big creature that when they cap that larvae, it's a dome. But there's a queen that's, she's about ready to hatch because this one is capped over. So this is somewhere between uh, say 10 and 16 days into the process of developing that queen. Again, I mentioned adding your second brood box, 70, 80% of the, the box is filled up, they're working, they're populated. It's time for another box and you don't need a queen excluder anyway because uh, this is all for, for the queen to be using those bottom couple of boxes. Yeah, we talked about honey flow a bit ago. Uh, this is buckwheat. This stuff will make some honey that looks like used motor oil. It smells like molasses. Some people love it and some people say, don't ever sell me that crap again. Uh, <laughs> I traded a guy a couple of buckets of some, for some buckwheat honey and I'm just about out. I have a few people that ask for it specifically. And I have a whole bunch of people say I don't want that again. And uh, yeah, I just mentioned this a little bit ago. I run nine frames, uh, always nine frames in the supers, but now I run nine frames in my, in my brood boxes also. It's just easier for me to remove them and, and work with my bees and manipulate what's going on. Great. You say in a 10 frame box, you're only running nine. Is that what you're yeah, saying? I'll put 10 in there at first and yeah. let them start building the honeycomb. And when they start drawing it all out, then I'll remove one and space them space all out. One. And then, because uh, the brood chamber, it still doesn't exceed that bee space by much. They're, they're not going to do too much bird comb. But it's so much easier for me to pull that outer frame out, remove it, and get into the core of the hive without damaging bees. So yeah. I run nine frames through everything. It also makes them just a little bit lighter as far as the brood boxes go. Uh, this is honey capped. We say capped. The honeycomb cells had nectar placed in it, filled up with nectar. They dried it down from 80, 90 percent water to about 15 or 16 percent. Put a wax cap on there. It's just like a fruit jar. That's their their little jar of honey ready to go. Um, how much that holds, I don't know. Probably a tenth of a teaspoon, maybe, in each one of those little cells. Uh, we looked at this one also, uh, Summer Dearth. This is one we get calls from Casey's and the convenience stores because the soda pop trash in their, uh, in their trash can right by the door is drawing uh, bees and flies and, and all kinds of other critters in. And they just need to clean them up and move them around the corner. Always like that when I talk about controlling swarms. There ain't no such thing. Man, if your hive wants to swarm, they're going to swarm in spite of or even because of whatever you do to them. Some bees are just predispositioned to swarm more. The Russian hybrids, that's one of the ways they manage the varroa mite is they swarm frequently. And what that does is helps break up the brood uh, rearing so they can uh, help manage the uh, varroa mite a little bit better. But just watch your hive periodically, look for signs of crowding, make sure it's time to add another box, add another box, but don't, don't give them too much too soon. Because uh, they, they need to be able to patrol well for pests and, and uh, other insects that get in there, like the wasp may show up in there and want to take some nectar with her and so forth. And so don't give them too much real estate, but uh, don't crowd them either. I mentioned the stop eating syrup. When they stop taking it, that's kind of a sign that, they're, that they've had enough. Keep your pests under control. We're going to do a little bit more of that here in a moment ago, a moment from now. Uh, we've heard about bees absconding because the varroa mite population just expanded so much the bees couldn't manage it anymore they just gave up and they literally left the hive. That is rare hopefully but uh, there we go. There's some, some swarming queen cells because they're at the bottom of the frame. When you see these queen cells up in the upper part that tells you I may have a problem. Maybe I lost my queen or maybe she's not very healthy and they're replacing her but when the queen cells are down at the bottom, that means we're going to swarm here in a few days. And the first one that hatches is going to kill the rest of them. And uh, maybe up to 70% of the high population is going to leave with the existing queen, the, the mother queen, and the remaining uh, population will stay behind with the new queen after she's mated and so forth. But uh, you have a decision here. You think, you know, i got an extra box. What the heck? I'm going to make a split. I'm going to get a whole new hive. A frame like this would be really good to have. Uh, put that in the middle of your, your uh, nucleus box or 
or your, your other uh, brood chamber if you have a spare. And you put in another frame or two of some, uh, of some brood with uh, bees in there. Move them away because the worker bees will come right back to the old colony. But when we say move a colony, it's either move them a couple foot or a couple miles. If you move them a couple of feet, they can find it easily. But if you move them a couple of miles, if you're making a split hive like this, is a situation of a split that I'm talking about here anyway, you'll want to move those maybe across the yard to be okay, but uh, in a completely different location would be better yet. If you've got a friend out of the pasture outside of town or, or friend you can put them in their backyard perhaps, now you can make your own split and it maybe won't build up big population by the end of the year, but you'll need to feed them obviously. Some syrup, maybe a pollen patty, but uh, it's a decision. Some other people say, no, nope, I don't want to mess with this. They're going to take their hive tool and just scrape these off and destroy them. And the bees will say, okay, well, maybe we won't swarm. Or they might say, by golly, we're going to swarm. Go make some more queen cells and, and do it all again. So once you start seeing that, if you don't want to do something with these uh, bees to make a new split, you may need to make a decision to destroy them and then keep monitoring regularly because they may have some some other queen cells somewhere else, they're going to swarm. <clears throat> some bees just have a propensity to swarm. The Africanized bees, man, they swarm, swarm, swarm. And that swarm may be a little handful like this. But a, uh, an Italian beehive, when they swarm, it can be 10, 20, 30,000 population. These are some pretty good, I think that photograph is elongated. They shouldn't be so long, but, uh, but this is an example. And I would consider this to be supersedure, meaning I might have a sick queen or a missing queen and they're making an emergency queen up here. If that's the case, I'm gonna look around and see where my queen is. If she's in there, are there any eggs? Maybe she's ran out of sperm or, or had some other kind of a health issue. Or maybe a pesticide got brought in with some pollen that made her sick or it could be a number of things. But if you don't find the queen at all, you don't wanna make a split with this. This is, your, this is them making your emergency queen for you. And uh, one of them will hopefully get out and be mated successfully and and take over the colony again. Sometimes I'll make a cup, just a little queen cup like this, and um, they may never do a darn thing with it. They may just put it there on the side of a frame, and it's just there like, yeah, if we need a queen, we'll, we'll be ready for her if the time comes. And they may never do a thing with it. I think we looked at this one the other day. Uh, the blue is not blue honey, although down south it has a weed called kudzu. It's a viney plant that grows over, you probably saw that in North Carolina. Yeah, the uh, it'll grow right over power poles and kill trees. It's so aggressive, and they say it makes a purple honey. I haven't found any yet, but uh, I need to trade somebody from down south maybe. But picnics or garbage, yeah, the bees are going to find your neighbors feeding their uh, hummingbirds. That nectar that uh, that they put in there might be attracted to the bees, depending on the time of year. Robbing. This is a uh, this is a severe situation. I think I've mentioned that before, where. Uh, it happens often in a dark, like in July, August, when there's just not much blooming. It's hot, bone dry in Kansas, and there's a strong hive in a tree somewhere, and they found your hive, and they're gonna come in and murder every bee in sight and clean out the honey. And it, it happens over a pretty quick period of time. But when you see some activity like that, it's, it's maybe time to intervene if it's not too late already. So here we go, trying to keep your hives healthy. Don't let them get too weak. Um, if it's a split that you just made, an entrance reducer is really important. That little opening like that, or like that metal opening where it's only about a dozen holes, like on that hive there, they can defend that against uh, wasps or, or some enemy uh, beehives. But if you have the whole bottom open there, they'll have a hard time defending that large space. Relocating might be in order. And a robbing screen, we'll see some robbing screens here in a little bit. Uh, if you're opening up hives and there's a robbing situation happen, make it fast. If you're feeding, do your feed inside the hive through a frame feeder. You want to, because uh, things, things like an open feeder outside, like a uh, chicken water or a syrup in it, man, that'll bring in robbing because other bees will come in from all over and they'll see that and, oh, there's a hive over here. I wonder if they got it in there. And that could just invite a robbing scenario. So whenever you're feeding your bees, you want to do it in the hive if at all possible and invisible from any other bees. This is a robbing screen. I mean, they're simple to make, just a little, uh, not really hail screen, something small enough that a bee can't get through there, like the screen on this package cage. I say, well, what are you doing with these old, uh, these old cages? So I don't know, I usually rip the screen off and I'll make some stuff out of them. Uh, got grandkids that 
collecting bugs for classes and things like that. There's all kinds of use for that. That would be perfect use for some of that screen. And it's just a little wooden device about four or five inches tall. We'll place it right at the entrance of the hive. And then uh, California University of Davis discovered something really strange. This colony, say for example, was robbing another colony or trying to, well they have a robbing screen on their own hive. They've got to climb up over there, fly over to this other hive. And this hive has got a robbing screen. They're not smart enough to think that I've got to climb up and over and go down. Somehow the bees only know if there's a screen on their hive, they know how to deal with it, but if there's one on another hive, they, they're not prone to get in there. Uh, all it does is just makes the bees, instead of growing right through the entrance, they've got to climb up and over and get around to, uh, to get inside the hive. Hmm. Very simple to make, very cheap, because you already got the screen with your package. Oh yeah, here we go, honey, the sweet reward. Oops. We'll talk about labeling too. When I passed that label around a little bit ago, uh, that's one of the talks we'll be doing uh, next Sunday in Dodge City is about selling honey in Kansas, the specific laws. You can give honey, sell honey out of your back porch, the trunk of your car, or dark alley, or your parking lot, or farmer's market. All day long, the state doesn't care. But as soon as you take that jar and put it on a shelf in the local do drop in convenience store, you gotta have a certified food processing facility that you bottle that in. And that's, there's a lot more to the law than that, but that's the quickest thing. Uh, when your frames of honey are capped over, meaning the nectar is dried down and they put a cap on it. That's their, this, their each one of these is a little fruit jar, you might say, full of honey. And the rest of that nectar maybe is brand new nectar. It's not quite dry yet. They didn't, uh, they haven't capped it yet. There's another trick too, you can pull out a frame if it's about, say, two thirds capped over. If you give it a quick shake and uh, the nectar flies out of there, it's way too wet. So don't be harvesting that. And I, I mentioned the flow hive last week because a young man here was interested in one. The uh, flow hive out of Australia, that little window, you only get to inspect just so much that hive. You might see this end of the frame right here. Oh, hey, this honey's ripe, it's ready to go. But the rest of that frame may be completely uh, raw nectar, not, uh, not ready to be harvested. And that's a nice frame of capped honey right there. Not quite a state fair quality frame, but uh, couldn't stop here for a second. All the crap got all my stuff. I mentioned to the folks over here last week, I put together a uh, extraction kit for well, anybody in the area can use it, borrow it, just ask them. Please want to donate a little bit to the Bee Lives Matter Foundation so I can donate uh, to all like the Save Farm and other, uh, other places like that. I think I mentioned the Save Farm last week. Save is Soldier Member Agriculture Location Education Farm. They are working with soldiers who are suffering from post traumatic stress disorder and uh, they're raising soybeans, cattle, wheat, and honey. I'm just going to turn, put this all together. A uh, friend of mine, retired Colonel Gary LaGrange, put that, uh, put that thing together a few years ago, and it's growing very well. This is obviously not a capped frame of honey here, but uh, parts of the kit that I got together, we got a heated pierce knife that will cut, the, the, cut that comb off. This is just a netting, a uh, bucket filter. So you're harvesting away and, and just kind of fillet it along, might have to wiggle it back and forth a little bit. They also make unheated knives, but this is what I've got to, for the loaner kit. This little uh, bucket device here just helps hold the frame so you, you've got something to work with while you're, uh, while you're cutting off the caps, turned over. Pretend she's not there. And you're gonna take that comb off or another tool I have is a, uh, some people use it just a capping fork. And you just take that frame and pretend this is all capped honey over here, just kind of fillet along or side to side. And every now and then there may be a little low spot in the comb. They may not all make a nice textbook frame like we saw earlier. There may be a little dip. You'll have to take your comb and kind of dig that out anyway or scratch it. This device I have not used yet. Um, I forgot who makes it. It's, uh, oh yeah, Be Smart Technology. It's just basically little plastic knives, and you just kind of slice down the, the capped comb. 
that would be okay if you just don't want to use anything with the beeswax. You don't need the beeswax for candles or cosmetics or anything because you're only going to get a small handful of, uh, of wax compared to when you use this knife, you're going to get a lot of wax off of that, uh, off that comb. I haven't used this yet, but the thing I'm thinking you're going to need is a bucket of hot water, very hot water, because that's going to fill full of wax pretty quick. So I think you'll probably need to dip it and maybe maybe take the comb and comb that out. Because I, I look at that, I think it's going to get plugged up. Uh, some other things in the kit, I've got a strainer that so you can strain the honey out of the extractor. It's a two-piece, so the coarser stuff will capture in here. Your oh, maybe a broken wing from a bee that somehow got caught in there. Uh, it does happen and uh, larger chunks of wax and then there's a much finer screen down here at the bottom so that sits on a five gallon bucket I didn't bring the extractor it's a four frame hand crank extractor but uh, <coughs> anyway it's about six hundred dollars worth of stuff five hundred fifty somewhere around there that I didn't pay all that for it some of it I got from an auction or two but anyway it's available if you ever need it just get a hold of me and uh, we'll hook you up with it but uh, yeah the honey harvesting Around here, August is about the earliest you're going to be able to harvest any kind of honey. And you'll know that, that those uh, frames are completely capped over with wax. That means that honey is definitely ripe. I mentioned a bee brush the other day is one of the tools you might need uh, that you will need something. Paintbrush, feather, a bee brush works very well. You're not sweeping the bees off, you're more flicking them out of the way. So, uh, excuse me, so you're getting rid of them. And I forgot to bring my, this is an inner cover that has a uh, kind of a bee escape. It's sort of like the fish trap technology. The bees will climb out and go out through here. These openings are a little over a quarter of an inch wide. And if you uh, put it on the night before, they'll crawl out of the supers and they have a tough time getting back in. So tomorrow when you're harvesting honey, you'll have just a handful of bees to contend with up in the, up in the honey chambers. If you leave it on very long, they'll figure it out and they'll get back inside there. This is a compound I use that's called Fisher's Bee Quick. It smells really sweet, kind of an almond smell. It doesn't work near as well as the old fashioned chemical called Bego. Bego smells like vomit. I mean, that's the only way I can describe it. Uh, you put that on a fume board, squirt it onto a fume board, and set that over the top of the supers on a nice warm sunny day, and, and the, the odor kind of helps dry the bees out. Um, the Bego worked really quick. I mean, in minutes it would clear the bees out, but it also made you want to, you know, you know, people have a bad gag reflex. You don't want to use that stuff. And this, if you leave it in the back of your pickup by accident in the back seat, it smells nice in the cab the next day. It, it's like a, kind of like a little, uh, better than a little tree, Christmas tree thing hanging on there. Um, I've got a tub in the kit, that great tub on the ground to carry, is not here in the photo, but to carry the frames in so you don't have to carry them all, uh, all into a beehive body into the house. We do have a blower just because I bought an old beekeeper stuff and it happened to have a uh, bee blower. It was like a five, six hundred dollar item that Dedant sells. It's a gasoline uh, engine, like a lawnmower engine with a, a blower and it. it moves a lot of air. But what I did, my kids got me a, uh, a uh, cordless uh, leaf blower for Christmas a couple years ago. And uh, it's the same brand as all my other uh, tools. I use uh, Ryobi, so the batteries are kind of interchangeable. But it works okay to help blow some bees out of there, but more than anything, I'll use the I'll blow on the hive body when I have this fume board sitting on top of the supers to kind of get that smell down in there. I'll just kind of blow around the top of that to uh, help drive that odor down there. Because just not quite enough wind to, to displace the bees. And I don't want to damage my bees either. I figure that they're already ticked off because I'm stealing their honey. I don't need to hurt them on the process too. <clears throat> yeah, there's a, someone using the, uh, the comb. It's just kind of like a flay knot, just kind of go right along. Or, or here's a, the comb to be used in the low spots, the heated knife over here. And there's a motorized extractor. Two different types of extractors. Your hand cranks are usually a tangential, maybe a two frame or a four frame. And with those, as you are spinning them away and the honey is, you can watch it fly out of the because most of the extractors today have got a clear lid, the uh, ours are all stainless steel lid, uh, but uh, the loader kit has a clear lid so you can crank that and watch that honey fly out of there, it's so cool. And you open up, it smells so good. But the tangential ones, you have to pull the frame out and physically turn them over to get the other side of the honey uh, uh, honeycomb extracted out. The radials, like we've got a 32 frame and a couple of 20 frames that hold uh, a quite a variety of frames anyway, those don't have to be uh, turned around. They uh, you just insert them in there, flip on the motor, dial the speed, 
one of my, well, I guess both of them, uh, one my brother has and one I use mostly, he's got a timer where you say, okay, I want to ramp up to this speed in, in so many minutes, and it just slowly starts turning and eventually starts spinning pretty rapidly. Yeah, there we go, the motorized extractor on the left, and then the strainer. I got one of these bottling tanks. They're about $1,200 now. Uh, I got it from a, a fellow of his estate. Uh, he was a beekeeper. His widow made me a pretty good price on it. I had to do a lot of repairs to it, so I didn't get a huge bargain, but I'll use that a lot. What you've got here is a, uh, an outer tank and an inner tank. There's about an inch space between the two tanks, and you fill them with water up here. There's a... Uh, Probably the same heater, it's an electric water heater. It's about a 1500 watt unit. So this jacket has got water from, say, all the way up here on down to the bottom and around. This is a glass tube, so you can see where your water level is. And there's a thermometer on there. I store mine in the, in the tank at about 100 degrees. I figure that's about what the temperature is in the beehive, so I'm not damaging my honey. And the uh, mine is now insulated because I do some studies on it. I work in Midwest Energy, and my, my thing is uh, energy efficiency. and I uh, put a, a device on my, my heater, said, okay, if I don't insulate this tank and I walk by and it feels nice and warm, I'm just wasting heat in the room. But if I get some foil bubble wrap insulation, and I found out it is NSA approved for food processing facilities, so uh, I could wrap that around my tank, now I cut the electric usage in half, and I spaced it from my tank and put a, a little different layer of material in there, and I cut the electric usage into thirds. So instead of like eight bucks a month, now it cost me two to three to, to uh, run my heater. Yeah, I mean, it's not much, but think about that on a large scale. You know, if you're a commercial operator, uh, you're talking quite a bit of energy being consumed. We looked at this slide the other day. We've got some containers here we can pass around. If you wouldn't mind just kind of moving those along there. And this is all last year's honey, different uh, floral sources. In a grocery store, honey is sold by grade A, B. I've never seen a grade B, actually. Uh, there's no such thing. It's actually sold by color. All honey in the U.S., there's a, a FUND, P-F-U-N-D scale, and there's, I know there's 16 jars, well, one, two, three, four, five, 15 jars here, but there's 14 actual colors in the FUND scale, and it's anywhere from water white honey, which would be like um, fireweed, that grows up in Alaska and Canada, and this would be, one of these would probably be that buckwheat honey I was telling you about. Uh, looks just like used motor oil. And we call all of ours wildflower honey, even though the lightest honey is, I guarantee you, it's probably 95% clover and maybe a little uh, hand bats and some other early growing uh, flowers in there. But your earlier spring flowers, at least in this area, produce a lighter colored honey. And it has a higher glycemic content. In other words, it's going to crystallize pretty quickly compared to the darker honeys. The fall honeys from sunflower and alfalfa and other crops like that just seem to have a lot longer time span before they want to crystallize. So what sugar is, or what honey is, is just a highly concentrated colloid of sugar with a teeny, teeny bit of water in there. It started off as, uh, as sucrose, that's the sugar that's in the flowers, it's in the nectar. The bees took it into their, their honey gut, which blended an uh, enzyme with it, took it back to the hive, and that sugar got turned into glucose and fructose. So. The higher the glucose content, the more rapidly your honey is going to crystallize. Uh, cotton, there's not much cotton growing around here, but southwest Kansas, they've got a, a cotton gin out there, and that's a really white honey, and like Cairo syrup, and it crystallizes, I mean, just immediately. The guys joke about it, say, yeah, I can't even get the cap on it, it's already solid. Uh, it's just about that fast. But uh, you want your water content to be less than 18%. If you're really curious about that, there's a device you can buy called the Honey Refractometer. Um, little drop of honey on it, look in the tube, and there's a scale that'll show what the percentage of honey is, but we have one, but I don't think we really use it too often. Uh, we do, my brother takes honey to the state fair, and they will dock you if you're greater than 18%, so he likes to make sure he's 16 or so with any honey he puts in the fair. Higher water level in honey is also going to possibly uh, ferment, and so if you're extracting a lot of liquid nectar that's not quite dry down to honey, yet yeah, it, uh, it could kind of, uh, uh, we'll, we'll call it fermentation, I guess, because there's some wild yeast that may be in there. But you may look at the honey, it's kind of cloudy. It just looks a little cloudy, and after a while, it may smell foul. And it's probably something that the bees might consume it, but you may not want to because it's, it's just turning bad on you. So honey will not go bad unless moisture gets added to it or it's just not dry enough 
to the guinea. Uh, I mentioned they found honey in King Tut's tomb 3,400 years ago when he was around the, on the earth. They used honey as a medication for wounds and food and so forth. Uh, their honey is still good in those tombs that they found because it's bone dry out there in the desert, nice and warm. <clears throat> and if your honey does crystallize, just warm it up. I don't like to microwave because I think that's too intense of a, of a heat. But I'll put my water in the microwave and then put a jar or a, a, a container in the uh, in the hot water. That way I can turn it back to liquid again. Or I'll just scrape it out, put it in a little tub, and sell it as cream honey. We talked last week about organic honey. There ain't no darn such thing in America, but uh, Brazil, Uruguay, and a couple other countries in the in South America, they have some uh, farming regulations that if you meet their criteria and you live down in in that area, you may be able to get the organic. Uh, designation and the tree herders will buy your honey in America. <laughs> it's definitely not local because we're not anywhere near uh, the equator here. I'm going to grab a drink here real quick. How's our time, Jeff? You've been on for an hour. I can just see the clock from here if I pay attention to it. You guys want to take a quick break or you restroom or whatever? Let's do that. I can rest my throat. I have a cold.